Welcome to Pinewoods Chapel. My name is Chris Atkinson and I'm the pastor of Pinewoods Chapel and I'm so glad that you are able to connect with us today. During these difficult times, it's great to be connected to a community of faith. A community of faith offers all kinds of support and encouragement through difficult times. You can connect with our church online or you can swing by and drop by in person. Our offices are open through the week. Just go to our website to find out our location and time. Let me pray as we begin our time of worship today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can gather together in your name through this means. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would know you and understand you more deeply. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. 
36 verses 1 to 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea.
fortunate enough to live in Simcoe County, you have water, the world's longest freshwater beach in Wasaga Beach that you get to enjoy. You have Blue Mountain to ski on, you have flats that you can hike and a Y marsh and all kinds of features that allow us to enjoy creation. But that's only creation. There's all kinds of things that we get to enjoy in Canada, whether it's housing or just subjective well-being, personal security. And maybe some of our lives are not perfect, 
But when we compare Canadians to the rest of the world, when we're talking about jobs and earnings and skills, education, work-life balance, economies, income, wealth, we are very blessed in this world. And one of the things that is actually seductive for us in this environment is to think that this world and the benefits that we have, that we enjoy, end up being our savior. Where we put all of our trust and hope in this world, in the things around us, in all of the possessions, all of the things that we actually have. Instead of placing our trust and hope in a God who loves us. One of the things that we see in the book of Revelation is that there is a time that's coming where all of this world, systems, education, economies, rulers, everything that we see around us will actually be destroyed by God. As we've been going through the book of Revelation, we have seen these visions that God has given John about the things that are yet to take place. And as we travel through the book of Revelation, we now come to Revelation 17 and 18, where we see this fall of Babylon. Uh, during the sounding of the seventh trumpet and these seven angels that came out with the plagues and these bowls of wrath, we are told about how Babylon will fall. And as you read, read these passages, this, this mystery of Babylon, Babylon the Great, is to some of us a great mystery. And it is meant to be a mystery for those who were reading this. There were symbols and all kinds of things used to hide the true meaning in case this information fell into the hands of the wrong people and they would then be persecuted because of it. So let's just unpack chapters 17 and 18. I'm not gonna read all of the chapter 17 and 18. I would encourage you uh, when uh, finish this that you just sit down and read both chapters and try and digest some of the things that we're talking about here. But what we see here is this, this moment where one of the angels who had one of the seven bulls comes to John and sort of takes John to this other location and he sees this woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Let's read verse 1 in chapter 17. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Here we see this very vivid picture. And again, there's all kinds of symbolism that's here representing what John is trying to communicate what this actually is. Well, we know from the description that this is a woman who is like a prostitute. Now, it doesn't give the name literally of this woman. It's this whole uh, 
metaphor for prostitution. And all throughout Scripture, we see God speaking to those who have uh, committed fornication or adultery with other things other than God. As we read through chapter 18, what we see in verse 2 of chapter 18 is we see that Babylon is this dwelling place of demons. And kings have given in to this woman's seduction. And that's why this imagery of a prostitute is used. But also that merchants have grown rich through trade in this great city of Babylon. For those who read this vision for the very first time as John shared it to the seven churches that are in Revelation, those first century readers would have understood Babylon to be Rome. When we look back in history, we actually see in non-Christian inscriptions that Babylon was a name for Rome. And Babylon, at the time of this writing, was this place, Rome, was this place where all trade happened. Remember at the time that John is writing this, around 90 AD, uh, the Roman Empire is the empire. It's the empire that rules the world, and that Roman Empire expanded itself all across the world, even into places that we know today, like Britain and uh, Europe and places like that, further south into Africa and Egypt and all of those places. Rome was this mega center of trade, of wealth, of culture, and with that came religion and all the pagan gods of the Roman Empire. And many of those we are still familiar with today, whether it's Zeus and, or Thor and all of these other things, all of that is based in this Roman Empire. And one of the things that we actually know today, historically, is that even the Western culture and environment and economy that we enjoy here in Canada and also the US and Australia, the British Commonwealth and, and European countries, All of that finds its roots in this Roman Empire. So when we look at Babylon, this mystery, what we actually see is that Babylon is the prevailing economic religious system that's in alliance with the government and its related authorities. And this metaphor of Babylon has existed throughout the ages. And there's a number of things that uh, John is speaking to those first century readers because a lot of them were tied up in this whole uh, economic governmental practice that actually barred them from worshiping Jesus, worshiping God. It was actually customary that those who were of a, of a trade had a a guild or union in our words today, where they had patron gods to which the members had to pay homage as well as to the Roman emperor. And if Christians did not participate in such homage, they were economically ostracized and prevented from practicing their trade. And this whole system of organization is what is represented by this woman sitting on this scarlet beast. This, as it says, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abomination. Really speaking to the crookedness of the world systems. And so what we see here is this vision of this Babylon, this world system, economy, religion, and all of the things that go along with that, with governments and kingdoms and societies and cultures and practices. And in the midst of this, what God is telling John, what he is telling his people is that this 
mystery Babylon is fallen. Now, as we continue reading through chapter 17 and 18, over in chapter 18, verse 4, we are introduced to this other voice from heaven that John hears that says, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. You see, not only do we need to understand this mystery of Babylon, but we also need to realize that as believers, we need to sell, separate ourselves from Babylon. When this voice that it's announced from heaven says, come out of her, my people. This is God speaking to the believers. It's God warning us ahead of time that we could get caught in her sins and also share in her plagues. There's many passages of the scripture, even Jesus himself encourages us to be in the world, but not of the world. Yes, we are born into this world. Yes, we live, we have houses, we have jobs, we have things that this world provides for us. But we're not to be of the world. We are in it, but not of it and practicing the things that this world does. One of the things that we see here in this verse is that there's a separation of behavior. It says, Less, come out of her, come out of this metaphor of Babylon, this world system, lest you take part in her sins. You see, there must be a separation of behavior for the believer from the things of this world. Things like where we worship materialism, where we worship wealth, where we place our hope and trust in the systems of this world, including governments and institutions and ideologies that are ideologies that are in our world. And it is a fine line between being of the things of this world and actually being in the world. Because sometimes the things of this world consume us so much, consume us so much of our time, our energy, our thoughts, our pocketbooks, that we're just not in the world, but we find ourselves of it. Propagating even the ideologies and the seduction that is in our world to those around us. And what God actually warns here is he says, come out of her lest you share in her plagues because there's this plague that's coming to Babylon. We've already read about this in chapters 15 and 16 about these bold judgments that are going to be poured out on the systems of this world. But here in chapter 17 and 18, we get very specific about what will it look like? How will it play out? And one of the things that we see here is that there is this great judgment that's coming on Babylon. And part of her plagues is basically the destruction. Babylon can't be a mystery to us. We need to know what it is so that we can come out of that mystery and separate ourselves out to God. And God warns us of these, and this is really a warning for believers, those who believe in Jesus, not to get caught up in the systems of the world. And this is so tempting for us as believers because we have it so great here in Canada. There's so many beautiful and wonderful things that we get to enjoy about our country, about the world around us. But, we, but may we never put our whole hope and trust in the systems of Canada, in the culture of Canada, in the economy of Canada. Because what we see here is that judgment is coming. As we look to Babylon and we understand that it's this uh, economic religious system that is a part of the government and it, all of its related authorities, what we see in verse 5, it says, For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. 
pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. To what we see here is that God will pay this Babylonian system back because the Babylonian sister is system is hurtful to others. There's a corruption that's in the world systems that people want to ignore and actually justify. This idea of an economy that is without destruction, that cannot be destroyed, or glorifies itself saying that we're the best. And sometimes we don't actually say those words, but yes, we think them. And all of that is Babylon. And what we see here is that God is going to pay back Babylon, not just Babylon of Canada, but Babylon of the whole wide world. And it says in verse 8, For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death, mourning, and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. God will destroy the world economy, world religion, and all government systems. That, in some days, actually just saying that would be treason. At the time when John wrote this, and as God was revealing these visions to John, it was treason. It, it would get you into a lot of trouble, which is part of the reason why John was exiled on the island of Patmos. What we, what we see today is this talk of being Jesus, the king of kings, where all kingdoms must submit and fall under the reign of the king Jesus actually is met with a lot of resistance today. People call it a myth that God even exists. But what we see in scripture and what we believe to be true is that every kingdom will bow to the King of Kings, Lord Jesus. And that doesn't exclude Canada and all of the political powers, all of the economy. And Canada, it does, it ranks high in standard of living around the world. But all of these things, all religions will come to nothing because God is judging the systems of this world. So let us not put our hope and trust in the systems of this world because it's really not God's government. God's government is different. It starts with Jesus. We're told about that in Isaiah that the government shall be upon his shoulders. It's not our job as Christians to change the government to be in line with God. It's actually God's responsibility to rule and to reign. And as we're quickly going to find out in Revelation, that day is yet to come. This is really a warning for believers to not get caught up in this Babylonian system of our world. It's also an education for us to know that these things are there, to know that they are real. And yes, there is this metaphor of what it actually means be in and of this world. But we need to take note that this, the systems of this world, this Babylonian system, it will fall. And God will be glorified. And God will bring justice to bear on all the corruption that's ever happened in the world, all the lies that have ever happened in the world, all the injustice that has taken place within government corruption, within false deeds, within all of that.
God will judge. So let us not be a part of the world system, but let us separate ourselves and worship Jesus as we wait for him to set up his kingdom because he is the king of kings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that instructs us, but actually also warns us in these times when we look around and we know in our hearts that the systems of this world are broken with the injustice that we even maybe have personally experienced, but that we see is out there. Lord, I pray that we as believers would not be caught in and of the systems of this world, but that we would separate ourselves out, that we would be in this world, but not of the world. And Lord, that we would know that there's a day coming when you will make right all of the wrongs that have happened in this world. Lord, I pray for that day to come. And Lord, I pray also that we would have eyes to see this mystery, Babylon the Great, and that we would not take part in the abominations, the wrongs, the evil that is perpetuated in this world. So Lord, we give you praise. We thank you for wisdom. We pray for wisdom and discernment as we look to recognize Babylon the Great. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. It has been great to be together today. I hope you've enjoyed our time of worship and gathering, opening up God's word. Know that you are loved by God and by those of us at Pinewoods Chapel. On the screen, there are some questions for you to think further about, about what we've been talking about today. And we will see you next week, if not before. God bless you.
What's the worst that could happen? Hey, Jeff. I was wondering if you'd like to go to church with us sometime. I just thought. I just thought. Okay, 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 okay. Hey, Jeff. Oh, hey, man, what's going on? Hey, uh, I was wondering if you'd like to join us for church on Sunday. Yeah, I don't see why not. Cool, man. Hey church, there's now a very important step you need to take to make sure you're not missing important church updates on Facebook. Just open up the Facebook app on your phone, go to the church's page, click the like icon, then tap the three dots and tap the word following. Set the newsfeed option to favorites, live notifications to all, video notifications to all, and post to standard. Again, set the church's newsfeed to favorites and turn on all notifications. Now you're all set to stay connected and in the know.
Our vision is to be a growing church, seeking the power and direction of the Holy Spirit and working deliberately with our resources, abilities, and opportunities to further God's kingdom. Our mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to equip his disciples for mature Christian living, all for the glory of God. Our values are fivefold. We believe that it is incredibly important to be functioning as a church in all five of these areas. Our values are evangelism with intentionality and compassion. Discipleship that brings biblical change to every sphere of life. Worship that brings glory to God is engaging and compelling both to his people and to those who do not yet know him. Prayer that reflects confidence in the power of God. Community involvement that brings the wisdom of God to every human situation. One of the things that's so important about our church is having a healthy church. And what it means to be a healthy church means that we exemplify what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It means that we lift high the Word of God. It means that we worship God. It means that we have effective relationships. It means that we have effective structures and uh, ministry involvement that is really holistic when it comes to helping people become followers of Jesus Christ. It's so great that all of you can be here. I hope you enjoy the service today. Make sure that you're prepared to come into the throne room of God. <laughs>